This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is heading to D.C. The last-minute visit required intense secrecy and planning. Meanwhile, Russia cries foul at talks of Patriot missiles going to Ukraine. Former President Trump's tax returns could be released to the public. A House committee met Tuesday to vote on the possible release. We're bringing you more on what one congressman calls a dangerous new political weapon. The Texas National Guard is preparing for a surge of illegal border crossings. With migrants anticipating the end of Title 42, razor wire fences are being set up. Should I stay or should I go? Twitter users said go to Musk's Sunday poll, and the enigmatic CEO says he's doing just that. But there's a catch. And a 10-year-old who won his cancer battle and got a whole parade in celebration. We speak to him and his teachers who supported him through it all. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Good morning. It's Wednesday today, December 21st. We have a lot to get to this morning. We're starting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. He's visiting Washington today. It's his first known trip outside the country since Russia's invasion began in February. Zelensky was seen at a train station in a southern Polish city on his way to the U.S. on Wednesday. The visit to Washington is set to include Zelensky addressing Congress on Capitol Hill and a meeting with President Joe Biden. It comes as lawmakers are preparing to vote on a year-end spending package that includes about $45 billion in emergency assistance to Ukraine. Meanwhile, the U.S. is also preparing to send Patriot surface-to-air missiles to help stave off Russia's invasion. The latest round of U.S. funding would be the biggest American infusion of assistance yet to Ukraine. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi encouraged lawmakers to be on hand for today's evening session. To have an out, complete total hero in the Congress of the United States, fighting for democracy, leading people who are fighting for democracy, would bring honor to the Congress of the United States. Russia has warned about unspecific consequences if the U.S. provides Ukraine with Patriot missiles. It sees the shipment as further U.S. engagement in the war. Meanwhile, Zelensky made a dangerous trip yesterday to the city of Bakhmut. The city is located in Ukraine's contested Donetsk province. In video released by his office from the Bakhmut visit, Zelensky was handed a Ukrainian flag and mentioned delivering it to U.S. leaders. And out of domestic affairs, former President Trump's tax returns could be released to the public. The House Ways and Means Committee met in a closed session Tuesday to vote on the possible release. Entity's Arlene Richards reports. Pursuant to notice, the Ways and Means Committee will now come to order. In a private session, the House Ways and Means Committee voted on Tuesday on whether or not to release former President Trump's tax returns to the public. Under the law, the committee can make Trump's tax returns public if a majority of its members vote to do so. But a vote to release the records could have significant implications. Critics of the release say it could raise questions about whether the Democrat majority on the committee used their power as a political weapon against a Republican opponent. Although it's a significant act of transparency, some fear it could end taxpayer privacy. Former IRS Commissioner John Koskinen told the New York Times this kind of decision is a dangerous precedent. He cautioned that the committee should have a good reason for the release. When they made the request, Democrats said they had a legitimate legislative purpose for requesting the records as part of an oversight inquiry. Their purpose was to determine the scope of the IRS's audit of the president, specifically whether or not his business activities were reported on his individual tax returns. No Congress uh, has ever made private, made public, the full private tax returns of any American taxpayer. This is especially troubling because, as you heard us comment here at the end, um, this committee voted on documents that are not yet complete. Top Republican on the committee, Kevin Brady, said that Democrats were politicizing the tax code. So, uh, regrettably, uh, the deed is done. Uh, Over our uh, objections in opposition, Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee 
have uh, unleashed a dangerous new political weapon uh, that overturns decades of privacy protections for average taxpayers. The era of political targeting and of Congress's enemies list is back. Presidents are not required by law to release their tax returns, but for years they have done so voluntarily. Trump is the first major party candidate not to release his tax returns in four decades. Even if the committee votes against releasing Trump's records this month, there's still a chance they could be released later. Before House Republicans take over on January 3rd, the Senate Finance Committee will be able to obtain the returns. And that committee can then release information after its own review of the presidential audit program. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Now let's take a look at an update on the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border. The Texas National Guard has been deployed near El Paso. They're preparing for an expected influx of illegal border crossings. Soldiers built fences of razor wire along the Rio Grande yesterday. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the crisis at the southern border. Migrants gathered along both sides of the Rio Grande this week in anticipation of the end of Title 42. On Tuesday near El Paso, Texas National Guard soldiers and Texas state troopers constructed a nearly mile-long fence covered in razor wire to deter them. But it hasn't stopped migrants from attempting to cross illegally. Guard members are telling migrants to leave and go to a point of entry. Some migrants say they feel they were tricked into coming. Una burla hacia nosotros. I view it as a joke to give us hope and then, like a child, trick us and tell us that they are going to postpone Title 42. Many Venezuelans are fleeing socialism and looking for a brighter future in the U.S. Our illusions were completely shattered. My family was very hopeful that we would get through to that country and really progress. But you see how life is. We seem to be dragging the curse of Chavez. Title 42 allows U.S. authorities to rapidly expel illegal immigrants. A U.S. federal judge had ordered the COVID-19 restrictions to be lifted on Wednesday. But Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts put a temporary pause on the order Monday. That was in response to a legal challenge by 19 states. The freeze is meant to give parties time to respond. Nobody. The White House on Tuesday asked the Supreme Court to let the restrictions end. But citing the holiday season and logistical concerns, requested to be left in place until after December 27th. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin had this to say. 42 must be basically enforced and continued on. Manchin says it's not just important in the realm of the pandemic, but also the realm of security. He says there will never be meaningful immigration reform until the border is secured. You have to have a secure border. There have to be points of entry. There have to make, make sure that people go through the proper, proper vetting process. And those are all things that we can do. The U.S. Supreme Court now will decide whether to halt Title 42 while the state's legal challenge plays out. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And today at noon, Senator James Lankford and Republican senators will hold a press conference on Title 42 and the ongoing crisis at the southern border. NTD will be live streaming the event and you can watch it on our website, NTD.com. And then we continue with the latest installment of the so-called Twitter files that was released Tuesday, showing how the social media platform quietly aided U.S. intelligence officials' online campaigns. Here's the story. Journalist Lee Fong released part eight of the Twitter files on Tuesday. In a lengthy thread that was reposted by Twitter owner Elon Musk, Fang wrote that despite promises to shut down covert state-run propaganda networks, Twitter docs show that the social media giant directly assisted the U.S. military's influence operations. The files include screenshots of messages from U.S. Central Command, or CENTCOM, to Twitter. Fang wrote, in 2017, a CENTCOM official sent Twitter a list of 52 Arab language accounts we used to amplify certain messages. The official asked for priority service for six accounts, verification for one, and whitelist abilities for the others. The thread continued. The same day CENTCOM sent the list, Twitter officials used a tool to grant a special whitelist tag that essentially provides verification status to the accounts without the blue check, meaning they are exempt from spam or abuse flags, more visible or likely to trend on hashtags. 
According to Fang, those accounts primarily posted about U.S. operations in the Middle East, including promoting messages targeting Iran and the Saudi war in Yemen. CENTCOM then appeared to make the accounts look unconnected to the U.S. Fang said according to records he viewed, many of these accounts continued tweeting throughout this year, and some were not suspended until May 2022 or later. The report concluded that Twitter actively assisted CENTCOM's network going back to 2017, and as late as 2020 knew these accounts were covert or designed to deceive to manipulate the discourse, a violation of Twitter's policies and promises. They waited years to suspend. Fang added that he was given access to Twitter for a few days, but Twitter had no input into this report. We reached out to CENTCOM for their response and are still waiting to hear back. Elon Musk said yesterday that he will resign as chief executive of Twitter once a replacement has been found. This after a poll he launched on Sunday resulted in Twitter users calling for him to step down. Musk has said he will give up the Twitter CEO post, quote, as soon as I find someone foolish enough to take the job. He says he will then turn his focus to running the software and servers teams. Calls for, from Wall Street for Musk to step down had been growing for weeks. Some Tesla shareholders have questioned his focus on the social media platform. They wonder if it's distracting him from properly leading the electric vehicle business, where he's key to product design and engineering. And still to come, the joy of a colossal victory in the hard-fought World Cup has driven some fans in Argentina into a frenzy. Police in Buenos Aires had their hands full. And a new discovery of Nazca lines in Peru. Find out more about the mysterious phenomena that's intrigued scientists and visitors for decades after the break. Shen Yun Creations. The streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Good to have you back. We're continuing with an update on yesterday's earthquake in California. At least a dozen people were injured. Two others died from medical emergencies after the 6.4 magnitude quake. Here are the details. California resident Darren Gallagher woke up to this, damage to his Rio del home after a strong 6.4 magnitude earthquake struck off the coast of Northern California, followed by more than three dozen aftershocks. Houses, a bridge, and several roads were damaged, with one road reportedly sinking due to the quake. Thousands of homes and businesses were left without power on Tuesday, and officials said there were gas leaks in the region. For Gallagher, his porch got the worst of it. Sleeping on the couch and I heard a big bang and stuff started falling, so I opened the door and this is what I opened it up to, right here. Whole front porch fell off. There's a dirt bike over there holding up that end. I just remember walking out of the house and seeing like our house basically on the ground and our, our porch higher than the house. Jackie McIntosh said she and her husband had put their Rio Del house up for sale and they were expecting an offer. That was before the quake. I don't think this house is going to be able to be brought back. There was an earthquake in, I think it was 92, that this happened to the house last time. Um, And I just, I don't know if it's gonna come back from this one. Calls for help came in fast after the quake struck around 2.30 in the morning on Tuesday, said Rio Del City Manager Kyle Knopp. Uh, within the first 20 minutes, there was uh, uh, multiple calls. Uh, in the first hours, uh, over 60 calls for assistance, 10 of which were medical. 
uh, related, um, one of which was uh, uh, unfortunately a cardiac arrest uh, and fatality. Knopp said the quake, which was felt miles away in San Francisco, definitely packed some punch. It was also a long duration uh, earthquake uh, that uh, certainly has had a major impact uh, on this community. He added that there was significant damage to Rio Dell's water system and that some residents on Tuesday were left without it. Riot police clashed with Argentina soccer fans on Tuesday night in the streets of Buenos Aires after the World Cup victory parade. According to local media, the clashes began when police tried to remove two fanatics from the top of the obelisk monument in Republic Square. Rioting soccer fans, some wearing the Argentina team soccer jersey, were seen throwing objects toward riot police. A Reuters video showed a group of people smashing the gates of a bank, taking items out and loading them into a minivan. Plans to parade Argentina's World Cup heroes through Buenos Aires in an open top bus had to be abandoned. That's after millions of ecstatic fans flooded the streets and brought the city to a standstill, causing security fears. Archaeologists discovered dozens of new patterns of Nazca lines in Peru. The mysterious pre-Inca geoglyphs have intrigued scientists and visitors for decades. Let's take a look. Here on the dry, wind-swept plateau of southern Peru, researchers have discovered more than 100 new shapes carved into the earth more than 1,000 years before European colonists set foot on South America. For decades, researchers have been documenting Peru's geoglyphs, also called Nazca lines. Many of those previously discovered are massive, a spider, a hummingbird, a tree. They have intrigued scientists and visitors for decades. But this month, researchers announced the discovery of 168 new geoglyphs in the Nazca Pampa and surrounding areas along the Peruvian coast. Many are smaller than the previous discoveries. The discovery is made up of human and animal figures, from which stand out camelids, felines, birds and snakes. According to their characteristics, the figures were made by the peoples of the ancient Nazca culture between 100 BC and AD 300. These aerial photographs have been annotated with lines to illustrate the discoveries. A bird, a snake, a herd of camel-like animals cut into a hillside. There are human figures, some of them richly expressive. Until 2018, we had discovered 190 figures. These added to the latest 168, making 358 new figures in total in the grasslands. The new findings by a group of local and Japanese experts from Yamagata University are vestiges of Peru's rich pre-Columbian history. Located about three hours by road from the capital, Lima, they make up one of the main heritage sites in the country, but their study and conservation are complex due to the vast terrain they cover. The mystery about its origin and purpose remains, but this month's findings are set to help researchers to clarify their distribution patterns and how to preserve them. The new year is in sight as the seven-foot-tall numerals for 2023 arrived in Times Square on Tuesday. That's ahead of the annual New Year's Eve celebration. We love celebrating these milestones in our life, whether it's a birthday, an anniversary, or Times Square New Year's Eve. It's a moment for all of us to get together, celebrate life, and look forward with hope to the new year. 2023, I just want to be happy, healthy. Um, not, I don't have to be rich. I would just like to be able to pay off all my debt. That'd be nice. The famous numerals arrived after being transported on a cross-country trip. The Coast to Coast Tour started at the Kia Forum in Los Angeles, California, and visited holiday events in Nevada, Tennessee, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania, giving people across the country an opportunity to cheer the arrival of 2023. The four numerals are lit with a total of 602 energy-efficient LED bulbs. It will stay at Times Square Plaza for the public to have an opportunity to take photos through noon on Friday. And after the break, a heartwarming welcome back for a 10-year-old who won his cancer battle. We speak to him and the teachers who supported him through it all. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us.
This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. And next, we have the story of a boy who just won a 16-month battle against brain cancer. He was welcomed by his town for his first day back at school a few days ago, and what a welcome it was. Take a look at this. This is Chase McGee. All his friends and neighbors in Nutley, New Jersey, were waiting outside his door with welcome signs and applause when he was leaving for school that day. He even got a siren escort by the police and fire departments. I wanted to know more. I spoke to Chase and the teachers from Radcliffe Elementary, who were essential in the surprise and at the same time provided an essential support system for the 10-year-old during his chemotherapy. What were you thinking when you saw all of these people outside of your house? Um, very surprised. Very surprised? You had no idea what they were planning? No. T tell her about your hat. What did you do with your hat? Put it all over my face. <laughs> <laughs> and did you want to come outside at first? No. So what, so what happened when you didn't want to come outside? Everybody did what? All your friends did what? Came inside my house. Barged inside the house to get him. Wow, that's awesome. Why did you want to come outside, Chase? It just looked very scary to come outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Holly and um, Michael, you were part of this whole surprise and you organized it. Please tell me more about the planning. His kindergarten teacher from years ago, Stephanie Lennon, came to me um, and said, I know that you're very close with Chase's family. I have this idea. Um, I think that we should do a little welcome back surprise parade for Chase when we get a date finalized for his return. And from there, it kind of just snowballed. I went to his teacher, Danielle, who's next to me. Um, I went to our guidance counselor, Lauren Alfaro, and um, one of our third grade teachers who happened to be Chase's teacher last year, Maria Stremlo, whose husband is the police chief in town. And together, all of the rest of the people in town came together and just really made that happen. We have some families within our school who do um, great decorations and balloon work. So they contributed and volunteered their time to decorate the outside of the school. Chase's classmates, um, with the assistance of his classroom teacher and our guidance counselor, um, made a huge banner for him that they all signed. And all of the fourth grade girls in Chase's class got together and made individual signs for him that they were holding up. We also have a local DJ in town, Mike Chifo, who DJed the event for us. He kind of did like a mobile drive-by where he um, emceed the whole event from the street, had a playlist that Chase's parents had given us um, that we played as he came out. And Mike Chifo just kind of kept the whole parade moving along with the assistance of the police and fire department in town. Wow, that's awesome. And I think the school really went above be, above and beyond, right? Because I understand even before that, during the treatment, a lot of things were necessary to also keep Chase up to date with schoolwork and everything. Tell me more about who was involved in that, you know, making sure that he's keeping up with schoolwork. How did you guys support him throughout this experience? So Chase met uh, virtually with uh, Mrs. Alicia DiPremio every day, and I worked closely with her on all the content that we were working on in the classroom. And any projects that we did as a class, we would send home. Chase would you know, work on them with her, and then we would send them back, and we would display them with the rest of the students. And, you know, just working with her closely every day, Chase was able to keep up with the curriculum and the content. So, again, it's really important that you always get that right match. Um, I had numerous volunteers. Uh, we were a small town, uh, and people know each other all, all 
and so very quickly, as I said, there were a lot of volunteers and people who wanted to be part of this to help Chase make sure he's on track when he when he returns. Uh, but you know that was definitely working outside of school outside the school day. It was a lot of work for Chase as well. Who do you remember supporting you throughout everything? Um, Sydney Benelli. Mrs. Benelli. So Mrs. Benelli was his teacher, that special teacher that I was telling you about last year. Uh, because you know this has been going on for some time, and now this year he he worked with Mrs. DePremio because uh, obviously he advanced the grade level, and uh, that obviously works in conjunction with the whole room teacher. So right. at this point, in Moscow. Right, and Danielle, you are his teacher now. How is everything? Um, with Michael just mentioning, it's important not to have him uh, fall back and and all that. So how is he doing at the moment, considering he was such a home for such a long time? He's doing a great job. Uh, you know, he's participating, he's raising his hand, he's working with his peers, and, you know, he's on grade level. He's, he really worked very hard with Mrs. DePremio, and he came back, and he's doing a wonderful job. We also did several projects where he streamed in and, you know, like, presented some of his projects with the class, so he was able to have that connection with his peers as well. Why did you decide that it's important for you to take on all of this, uh, uh, take on uh, this upon yourself to help Chase? I mean, I think that we would do this for any student in our school, in our town, in our community. For me personally, like I said, this is my son's best friend, so it hit us very, very close to home. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we care about every student here, and absolutely, we would have done it for anybody, and we're so happy to have done it for Chase. So I got a phone call from Mrs. Jazz uh, when I was on the boardwalk. This is August of... 21? Yeah, and she called me to tell me what was going on. Uh, you know, my heart sunk, and I said, we're going to figure out how we're going to get through all this. And uh, we're so happy that we're all here having this interview with you and uh, about this guy. <laughs> we're just so happy that we are here to celebrate it now. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I... I'm happy. I'm happy to see all of you. I'm well. I, I, it's incredibly heartwarming the story. And Chase, I hope you really know how impressive that is that you pulled all of this off. Um, you know, I heard you were you had to do some twice the amount of work on some days. So I think that's amazing. Thank you all so much for coming on and sharing the story. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for having Thank us. You. Uh, that's really great that the school was able to make those accommodations so that he wouldn't fall behind on his studies. Yeah, you know, I think those are really the times where people, everybody in that case, gets put to the test, you know. Of course, Chase showed so much bravery, and I think if the people around him also got put to the test, whether or not they will show this kindness to him, and they really came through, and I thought that was amazing. Oh, yeah, it's a really great community effort. Hmm. On that note, we're ending the program here. Write us at goodmorning at ntd.com. If you have any stories or feedback that you would like to share with us, thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.